So welcome to this uh, digital deep dive. Uh, the digital deep dive that we're doing in this auditorium is uh, the cybersecurity everywhere one. If you were uh, intended to go to uh, join the female digital founder session, you should uh, leave again and go to auditorium B. So in reality, you just need to uh, go, go out that door and somebody will be there to guide you to the auditorium B. Um, Let's get the panelists for uh, the cybersecurity everywhere uh, up here immediately. You guys can just uh, come in, get seated. There's plenty of room up here, so you can join us up here. We uh, don't want to be lonely up here near the stage, so please do take those seats. So, um, introducing the panel, we have uh, Executive Director at Enisa, Johan Lepasar. Come up here, Johan. So we applaud Johan now. <laughs> have a seat, Johan. We have uh, head of unit European Commission, Christiane Kierkegaard de Veron. Christiane, you can do better. I know you can do better. Come on. Good. And uh, we have member of the executive board and head of legal and security at Bitcom, Susanna Demel. Have a seat, Susanna. And we do have Morten Lykkegaard, uh, I think, uh, in a taxi, uh, driving through Brussels as we speak, and he will be here uh, soon enough. Member of Parliament, Morten Lykkegaard, on his way. The session will be moderated by Alberto Di Felice, who is the Director of Infrastructure, Privacy and Security Policy at Digital Europe, and we will applaud Alberto as well. The panel is all yours, Alberto. I will Thanks a lot, go down. Mette. Uh, welcome back, everybody, uh, on this snowy day in Brussels. This is the session about the Cyber Resilience Act. I can hardly think of a proposal from this commission that sounds more important and more attuned to the theme of this conference. So thank you to all the speakers for, for joining us. Uh, of course, Christiane, I'm going to have to go with you first. Um, uh, and this is a, a, it's a big theme. It's a big proposal. Uh, the theme of the... the, the, the uh, uh, topic, the, the title of this these, the session is Cybersecurity Everywhere, which sort of describes the fact that it's a very big proposal and supposed to, for the first time, uh, put in place rules for all digital products when it comes to cybersecurity. It's the first time that we're doing it. And this is part of a big body of law and action that is coming at European level uh, and been, been accelerating quite dramatically in the past few years when it comes to cyber. It's hard to think that only 10 years ago, there was very little at European level when it comes to cyber. The first big cybersecurity strategy was 2013. So it's like the anniversary of something big that's happening at European level. Can you explain for the audience what this proposal is and what it does in combination with the rest of the things that your unit is dealing with? Yeah, thank you very much. I think if we look back, and you're absolutely right, it's been a busy 10 years and it's been very busy recently, but of course it also is a reflection of how society has evolved, uh, how the general digitization has been speeding up, uh, but also certainly if we look at how the threat environment is evolving and has evolved over the last couple of years. Um, so I think overall, and here I have to thank those who have come before me in this job and in the jobs uh, on cybersecurity to really say I think we're very lucky um, that we already have such a solid framework in place because there is certainly need for it. We see it very much now in terms of preparedness and response. So if we look at some of the, let's say, bigger pieces of the, uh, the, the rules we have in place already, of course, there's no way around NIST 2. Uh, this is very much a centerpiece. So with NIST 2, we're looking at the protection of critical infrastructure. We're going broader to cover more sectors. We're going deeper in terms of requirements. And we're also looking at strengthening member states' capabilities and ensuring better crisis coordination. In this too, we have the requirement um, that uh, the entities have to ensure security of the supply chain. And that's actually a very tricky requirement, because how do you do that? Uh, how do you make sure that whatever products you're using, whatever services you're using, that they are actually cyber secure? Uh, part of this response you will find uh, in the 
CSA, so in the Cyber Security Act, which is also part of the ACQI, which is what has, uh, we're also using to establishing ENISA, of course, so in itself a very important role, but also uh, in terms of uh, providing the basis for the development of certification where we could certify certain products, uh, processes or services at high level. But if you look across this, there is something missing which is very important in this puzzle, and that is, of course, the cybersecurity of products, of software and hardware, because if we look to the INISA reports on the vulnerabilities, uh, or sorry, on, on the incidents that have been reported under NIS, two-thirds of those are actually due to vulnerabilities in products. If we look at uh, CSAS, so the American Cybersecurity Agency's top 15 of vulnerabilities, it all relates to software. And if we take an overall look at all the major incidents we've seen in the last uh, couple of years, whether it's Soloin, Kaseya, Pulse Secure, it comes down to software security. Uh, so if we want to address also what is causing all of these uh, cyber incidents we're seeing, it is necessary that we take a much bigger look at both the security of software and hardware. Uh, so how are we doing that? Well, it's basically about putting requirements for the development, uh, so the design, the development, but also importantly the maintenance of both hardware and software. Uh, we want to have a life cycle approach, so we say even after placing the product on the market, you have to do the necessary security testing, you have to patch when you have vulnerabilities, and if you find uh, actively exploited vulnerabilities, you have to report them to INISA. Um, this is like a big change, we all acknowledge that, of course, but it's also a change that we see happening across the world. I think in many of our partner countries, and allies, they have also woken up to the fact that there cannot be proper cybersecurity without addressing the issue of software security and of hardware security. So in short, I think this is the role of the CRA. It is simply to make sure that the products that are put on the market are secure, but that they are also secured throughout the life cycle that they're on the market. Very good. Well, uh, that's a very clear explanation of what this is about, and uh, it's, 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 it's you know, quite appropriate after that to ask the audience. You know, we have Slido, we have questions that we're going to ask you, uh, people here in the auditorium as well as at home. And the first question is very, very easy, and particularly, I don't know how people can answer no after your uh, explanation, Christian, but the first question is, is it time to have cybersecurity rules for all connected products? Uh, very suspenseful sort of question. We'll get back to it as soon as we have the results. So, Johan, um, um, there's obviously uh, a, a role uh, for ANISA uh, in the CRA. Obviously, ANISA has a central role in everything related to cybersecurity. But when it comes to products specifically, uh, the Commission proposal has uh, a role, uh, part of the growing body of, of uh, tasks that ANISA uh, has been adding to its mandate over the course of the past few years. Uh, and so, uh, Christiana mentioned already the link with cybersecurity certification, which is also one of the uh, tools that the proposal envisages could be used to show compliance with the requirements, but also there's a role in uh, reporting uh, that the Commission envisages for, uh, for ANISA at this stage. How do you look at this proposal? How do you think it fits with the overall priorities and the mission of the agency? Well, if you look at the mission of the agency, it's very clear. It's uh, to bring about the high common level of cybersecurity across the union. And we see a big hole now, uh, which is essentially when, when it comes to the products and services and, uh, and how to tackle the issue of what is the minimum cybersecurity requirements that we, we have uh, to the products and services that are circulating in the internal markets. And yes. there is none. So you can't have a high common level of cybersecurity if you don't even have a minimum level of cybersecurity. So clearly we have a huge problem there. Um, I've been talking to a lot of vulnerability analysts recently to understand you know, how they see uh, the ecosystem. Um, 
and there is one thing that they keep coming back to is that they don't see that there is now currently a European dimension in it, and that is a problem. Uh, it's a problem for them uh, because they have a very heterogeneous environment. Uh, they don't really know, you know, once they they find out about vulnerabilities, they know the national system. They know the trusted partners that they do have, but they don't see where is the internal market response. Also, from the point of view of the, you know, the vendors or the producers, they now probably have to, you know, discuss with 27 member states at the same time. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Um, we had a case last year where there was a vulnerability which was exploited. We had a member state who notified us on, on 24th of November. Six others said they'd seen the same thing. Immediately, of course, they started to talk uh, uh, to the representatives. They received different kind of information. And in the end of the day, it was, I think it was 9th of December, we got a full picture of what was going on. And so it's two weeks. Um, we surely can do better. And I think we have a gap there. So if you ask me where I see Elisa's role, I see Elisa's role in, in making sure, in facilitating this at the EU level so that we, we can help member states to coordinate uh, the relevant information. Uh, we can help the Commission uh, to draw up guidelines. We can help the community uh, to develop frameworks how to handle these things at the union level, at the dimension that we are now missing. So I think that is, that is the essential part of, of the ethos of the agency, that I mean, we operate through our communities on, on when it comes to actively exploited vulnerabilities. I think the CSERT community, the CSERT network is at the heart of it, how, how the response at the European level should be handled. Uh, and Anita, of course, is there to support and make sure that the CSERT network functions properly. Uh, when it comes to, uh, yeah, certification was mentioned, or let's say standards or security guidelines, we are there to help the Commission to, to draw up certification schemes. The Commission is the authority that, you know, takes the implementing act in the end of the day, but we are there to give them our expertise. Uh, the same comes to European standardization bodies. We help them to, to analyze, to, to drill deep in, and, and, and to draw up uh, standards where relevant and necessary. Uh, and yeah, I mean, there are a number of ways that the Commission can act also within the CRA, uh, which the Commission needs our expertise and we are there to help them in, in this. So really, <laughs> I see Enisa as a facilitator, as a synergizer of common action to bring about this common high level of service security. And I, I repeat it, if you don't have a minimum level, you can't have a common high level. Very true. Thank you, Ewan. In the meantime, Mr. Lokegaard has, has joined us. Uh, thank you very much. I think I'll, because you're late, and I can say that because I'm Italian, I'm usually the one who's late. I'll re reshuffle the order. I'll go to Susanna, who's German, and she's never late, uh, like all Germans. Uh, so I'll ask her a question, and then I'll, I'll come to you if, if you allow. So, uh, Susanna, uh, Bitcom is as, as diverse a trade association as, as Digital Europe, and this is a big proposal that uh, impacts, let's say, the digital value chain very differently, right? We have uh, people who are more familiar with the sort of CE mark that's proposed under this proposal and, and people for which it will be a bit uh, newer. Um, what are your uh, learning so far about the proposal, the discussion that you've had in your membership? How do you look at the proposal from the industry point of view so far? Um, yes, yeah, as, as you said, Alberto, our membership um, um, is, is quite diverse. So we have the producers of, of, of uh, these products with digital elements as well as many user companies um, who, who buy those or who might um, use them in, in, in their services. So, of course, um, we, we always look at it from the perspective of each of these companies. and. Um, uh, what I can say is that we we definitely all share the um, uh, the thought that we really need to uh, strengthen our general security level um, because when we want to build the digital 
um, a, a more digital society and economy, then we definitely need to build on a stable basis. And um, as Johan has said, we, we, we need some minimum um, um, a level of security. This said, at the same time, I think we don't start from scratch. You have already mentioned a few of the... the uh, we've got the, the um, cyber uh, security framework. We've, we, we've got uh, a couple of um, legislative facts like uh, the, the machine, uh, machinery directive and stuff like that. So we have to make sure that whatever we do on a horizontal basis, um, works out with the um, already existing um, uh, legislation on a vertical <laughs> level as well. That's what makes it all really fun, <laughs> I think, for the Commission as well to, to get it all circled in there, w w what's already there. But this is really important and um, um, Morten and I, for example, had the chance to chat about that yesterday. Um, because when you think from uh, the perspective of a company producing a digital product or, or, or software, then you really face so many different legislative acts um, imposing some obligations onto you. You're facing different authorities on the national level as well as on a European level, but even on the national level alone there are so many. So it's really um, um, uh, uh, crucial that we, we, we um, and, and, and for the act, I think we need to sharpen the scope a little. We, uh, to, for example, when we look at software as a service, which is already under NIS, and, 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 but also m might be linked to, to a, uh, a product. And when we think about open source software, which, has, we, we, which we all want to promote and which is used widely also in, in, in companies, it is uh, in, in, in the commercial area, I think we have we, we might have to uh, do a few um, um, adjustments to the original draft to to really um, sharpen the scope and 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 make it um, easier to understand for those who have to actually implement the the rules and 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 um, um, design their products and 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 uh, test their products accordingly to make it um, easier to understand. Thanks. So that, that, that will be my, my first uh, point. Of, I've got a couple left, but maybe we can... Sure. <laughs> Thank you, so it's a very good appetizer. Uh, in the meantime, we have our poll. I don't think we have our results uh, yet, but since the first question was so easy, let's, let's try and, and have a second one added to that. Um, and that's, that's an interesting one, uh, particularly having just explained or started to explain what, could, uh, what this could look like uh, as an industry uh, uh, body. Um, do we need a regulatory sandbox to help companies comply uh, and help revise the rules in the future? So this is a new proposal. Uh, do we need to test it? Do we need to, some support, particularly given that this will be applicable also to smaller uh, companies that will be in scope? Do they need some help, similar to what we're doing with the AI Act, where the, the concept of, of a sandbox has already been introduced? Let's see what, um, what people think uh, about this one. And there's results already. And, <laughs> and there's definitive yes so far, but I'm sure things will, so. will evolve. <coughs> so Mr. Luckegaard, again, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, um, how do you look at this pro proposal? Are, do you think that we're ready to have this sort of single market instrument that this is? Looking at cybersecurity, uh, you've heard from Susanne the starting point for this, that we already have bits and pieces of cybersecurity le legislation or requirements here and there. Mm. The, the hope from, from our side, I think, as industry is that this can create a bit more harmonization, a bit more clarity for industry, and also some reassurance for consumers as to mm. what the rules are and how they can be applicable, implementable, enforceable. What's your perspective working on it in the, in the IMCO committee? Well, first of all, thank you for, for having me, and I uh, do apologize. It's kind of embarrassing to be told by an Italian that you're late, but uh, <laughs> uh, the other way around normally. Anyway, but thank you, thank you for... Uh, my only excuse is that I was taking part in another digital conference about, about, uh, about the NIST 2, uh, which is also a very important piece of legislation that we just, we just passed. Yeah, to, but to, to answer your question, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's immensely important that we do this exercise now. It's a huge task, I know, 
Uh, and, and I do think that cybersecurity is, by any means, uh, one of the most important areas uh, to actually put to, to, to come to some kind of conclusion on some kind of, of solution uh, when dealing with this in, in, in our times. I mean, for me as a politician, and, I'm, and I might start by, by saying that uh, I do have to, to make a disclaimer, I'm not an expert at all in this. Uh, I, I, two years ago, I went into this cybersecurity matter. Uh, I've then been dealing with the DSA the, uh, and, and stuff like that. But uh, this was really a wake-up call for me, really a wake-up call, because so much is at stake. Now we all know because of the Ukraine war, but, but we have been you know, engaged in a war for several years, basically. That's what, that was the re reason I, I engaged myself in this uh, cybersecurity matter. And, uh, and for every day, it seems that we miss something. We still have a lot of, of, of loopholes, we still have a lot of, of things to do, and that is and that is my excuse as a legislator to, to put all these things uh, on the table right now. We do know that it's, it's complicated. We do know that it takes a lot of efforts, a lot of investment. Uh, and, and part of the exercise now is to explain to you guys that, that this, this is needed. The good thing is that when we you know, started to do this work, everyone sort of said to us, well, thank you for doing this. You should have been doing this for years, but, but you didn't. But, uh, you know, better late than never. So here we are uh, imposing this also. So this is a natural step. Uh, I've been responsible for negotiating the NIST II. And, and we, as, a, as the, the term says, it's, we had a NIST I, which was not very successful, I would say. So six years after, we, tried, we try again uh, to revise it. And I think we have, we, have better, we have reasons to believe that this time would be, we are better off and we, we're doing a better job. Also because we have you on board. Everyone seems to be at the same opinion that now is the time. So I am quite optimistic also with the Resilience Act. Also because, I mean, the whole, this new method that is introduced, I don't know how new it is, basically we've done this for years, but the, this so-called new method where we cooperate with the industry is of course the only good way to do this because we need you guys on board. We need you, you you're, the, you're the experts, you know how to do this. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this, and I think we will, we will end up in a better place. Thank you, Mr. Lockegaard. Um, it's, a, it's a nice segue, f perhaps, for a, a second round, where uh, maybe I can go back to Christian. Um, uh, I think there's there's a lot of alignment. Everybody seems to want this proposal, and I think as the Europe we've been asking for the proposal for uh, for a few years actually, and we're very pleased that it's there. But obviously, the first uh, thing you do when you look at a, an actual proposal is you look at scope, and you think, is this feasible? Mm -hmm. Right? It's high time that we do something on cyber, uh, but we also know that the machinery to create you know the actual compliance scenarios for companies can take a bit longer, even though we're late already, you can argue. Um, but do you think that, you know, how do you look at the very broad scope that you, you guys put together in the commission? How do you make it work? What do you think needs to happen for it to be doable in two years, which is when you would like this to be uh, applicable? So indeed, it is a very broad scope, uh, and uh, we aim to cover as much ground as possible. We are very keen, of course, and I mentioned it already, to have the inclusion of software, because this is where we see that there are uh, the biggest issues. Uh, we also include, of course, commercial open uh, source, because we also know that uh, there is commercial open source in many, many products in our critical infrastructure. So with all of this in mind, uh, you know, when we were looking at the scope, it was clear that we could not just take, I would say, the easy way, but not the correct way of saying, let's do easy and focus only on IoT or something like this. And that's the reason why we have fully acknowledged, of course, that <coughs> there is a lot of work ahead. Now, if you're looking at, uh, you know, how are we going to make it simple to implement, because that, I think, is really the question here. How are we going to accompany the businesses that have to work with this? Uh, first of all, we actually already started uh, thinking about it and doing things about it. So we have already in place the notion of using the harmonized standards. Uh, we are already looking uh, at the Commission, we're making a preliminary uh, standardization request, it will come soon actually, we're following a little bit the logic 
that they did in the AI Act, because we know that it's going to be absolutely crucial for the success of this piece of legislation that we have the standards in place. So that's one work stream we're doing already. Um, we're doing a full mapping because we want to see you know, what's out there already in terms of standards. What are the international standards? What are international partners doing in this area? And all of this we're mapping to make sure that we're not reinventing things. We want to base ourselves on things that industry are already familiar with. So this is the first part in terms of making, let's say, the implementation easier. The second part is, of course, uh, the whole compliance issue. And here, I think we're very uh, careful, carefully also looking at the SMEs. Uh, I think compliance is always an issue for SMEs, and I think you also mentioned there are many different acts now, there are many things, places they need to report to, and so on. And I think for us, this is something which is a key concern. Um, we're actually organizing specific workshops with SMEs to understand how can we help you make compliance easier, what kind of tools can we make, what kind of support mechanisms can we put. Because whenever we talk to SMEs, they're also telling us, and especially when we're preparing it, they were telling us, don't get the crazy idea <laughs> that we should not be in the scope, because we want the CE marking. We don't want to be seen as not being cyber secure, so we want to be in. So this is really the balance that we need to work with them to find out, you're going to be in, but let's make it as easy as, simple, uh, as possible. The other thing, uh, or the last thing I want to raise, and it also concerns, of course, when you're a business and you need to report, you know, with all the different acts, I mean, I've been looking at uh, across the board, and it's true, there are certainly, especially if you're in the financial area, many different places you need to do reporting. Um, this is actually one of the reasons why we propose to have ENISA as a single reporting point. Uh, it is also to make life simpler for businesses, uh, because imagine if you're a software company, you're very likely to operate on 20, in 27 member states. Do you really want to have, when you're in the middle of an incident, do you really want to have to contact 27 different entities, probably with 27 different forms? Or do you want to have the simple way, which is we use NISA as an entry point and the information uh, is spread? So there are all of these elements that can be built in and have been built in to our proposal to really facilitate the implementation uh, for our businesses. Very good. Thank you, Christian. Uh, so maybe this is a good um, way f for me to ask uh, Johan uh, specifically about this point, because you talked about the European dimension and the fact that you know maybe business is ready for a more European dimension to doing this. Um, but there, there seems to be still some reticence to go in there, particularly from the member states, um, to some extent. We already see that at the beginning of the discussions in, in Council. So do you think that we're ready in terms of having that political discussion, and maybe starting with something a bit more um, you know, uh, doable, uh, manageable, like products in the CRA? Um, how do you see that uh, panning out? Well. The European dimension is also 21 languages, eh? so mm -hmm. um, I think we need to be mindful of that. But we still, I mean, if we talk about software, we still have one prevalent coding language, so uh, there are ways out. Um, I think what, what is important there as well is that uh, when we talk about this capacity to deal with this at the European level, that this is not something that is new. Uh, we already actually, at the NIS2 that was uh, published in, uh, in, in December, foresees that we set up uh, uh, the European Vulnerability Database. Okay, that's a bit of a different game, but it, it still goes in the same direction, uh, so that we have a uh, common European network in order to understand vulnerabilities, make sure that uh, we uh, synergize and synthesize the, the recommendations that the member states have produced on how to deal with these vulnerabilities, so that you have an easy way of not only understanding what are the vulnerabilities, but also what are the mitigating mechanisms that you can undertake. And we are missing that. Uh, so that, I mean, that's really <laughs> the kind of a first step. Uh, and we are now very quickly 
increasing our capacity as an agency in order to make sure that it just happens as a first step on this. Um, the CRA is really a higher level game in this sense, uh, but it cannot happen if we don't have these things in place. So I see that very much as a step-by-step, layer-by-layer approach that, uh, that we have taken, not only as an agency, but together with the member states. And we are already building these capabilities and capacities. None of it would have been possible if the CSERT network would not have been created in 2016, which has been actionable and in action since 2018, but even before informally. Huh? Um, what we are talking now is a more operational capacity at the European level, which would probably also mean that Cyclone, which is the new body uh, that is also created on the NIS2, will become more active and present. It's not yet there, but informally it does exist. So, again, I think there are multiple layers to build this European capacity and capability to deal with these issues. Um, are we there today? in order to undertake all these tasks as the CRA has proposed? Not yet, no? but I think we have the pillars to do that. So, and, I, and I think that's something also that the member states understand more and more, that we do have the capabilities uh, at the European level in order to undertake these tasks that the CRA foresees. Very true. So very incremental. Also very important what you said about vulnerabilities and what was done under NIST 2 there. So um, very good. So maybe I can go back to Susanna. Um, and, and Christian was very, um, very clear about the, the building blocks of making this easy. So she mentioned harmonized standards uh, clearly as a, a, a central pillar of that. Um, where do you think we stand overall to, uh, as industry in delivering you know, harmonized standards for the, the whole uh, host of uh, products that will be in scope? And can we do it in two years? No. How hopeful are you? No, no we can't. No? No, uh, I, I actually, I really wanted to, um, uh, to respond to that because when you think about it, um, the, of course, we have in, in, for, for some things we already have, might have standards or, or parts in existing standards that we could use. So we, we, we were going to have to identify what we already have for, what, that, that, that might use as a standard um, for, for a cons, uh, conformity assessments. But if you think about it, um, there will also be um, uh, a few uh, or, or quite a, a lot of new things that we have to agree upon in the standardization bodies that we have to think about how would we implement this and that legal provision and, and, and opera, uh, opera, uh, make it operational. So um, um, that'll take a lot of time and effort, and it'll take security experts and standardization experts, something we don't really have <laughs> at hand uh, uh, at, at an uh, uh, infinite uh, number. So um, we really th have to uh, come up with a smart plan and, and prioritizing um, aspects. So one idea that we have is that we might uh, it, it might be an idea to um, um, extend the, um, the transition period for certain of the criticality products for, for a little longer after having assessed what's to be done. Because then again, I would like to um, um, draw the attention not only to this act, but then we also have the ongoing AI Act, we have the Data Act, we have um, uh, uh, some, some more to come, and they all involve the NLF, they all involve conformity assessment, certification schemes, so this all has to go through the same or similar, <laughs> the same group of standardization bodies, and um, I think um, th that's going to be a huge effort that we all, uh, the, the companies have to do it, and it's, it's getting harder because they only already haven't got enough experts to develop these products, but then again, they also s need to send experts into the um, standardization bodies. So I think that it needs a joint effort and it needs prioritization and it needs a, um, a realistic look on what are our resources and what can we do in a certain time frame um, 
that, that's that's really important in in in, in my view, and. Um, also on the on the reporting side and the um, the vul uh, vulnerabilities, I think it's good if we can do that on a European level and if we have Inisa building up capacities to to um, support uh, uh, companies there. Um, we, we, we really need secure transmission and secure storage of all this information. That database is quite a sensitive one, I, I, I think. So um, there, there again, um, we really need a good coordination and, and planning for that. Thank you. Morten, you wanted to add Yeah, well, I think anyway. this is, this is uh, maybe the most important, uh, most important discussion when dealing with this, with this issue because, I mean, to quote one of my... my uh, my colleagues, uh, Margrethe Vestager, which is, uh, by the way, responsible for the, <laughs> for the whole thing in the sense that she's, she's responsible for, for the digital developments. I mean, I remember three, four years ago, I had a conversation with her when she said, well, to be frank, the most important thing for me in this term would be to, to keep it simple and to implement right. I mean, to, 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 to actually get the implementation right, because we have so much very good uh, legislation, but if we have a reality check, and I do have reality checks also within these two, uh, as, I, as I told you. The, the signals are very clear from industry. We do need this, but we are overburdened, we are overwhelmed by the, by the, the fact that we have so many pieces of legislation you know, interacting, uh, and we do see and this is not a uh, this is not a criticism of, of the, the, the commission because I think you're doing a great a great work, but Every time you come up with a new piece of legislation, bureaucracy follows, new rules, new ways of, of, of thinking. You know, everyone has to legitimate the, the work. And, and uh, the, the end result uh, is a whole mountain of, of, of new, uh, new tasks for, for the industry. So I would say at some point, I hope that we can give you, you guys some kind of guarantee that we will stop putting new things on the table and say, just let's just spend a few years just to implement these things and, and see how it works. Because, and, and, and one other thing, <laughs> well, it's not a guarantee, applause. not a guarantee, but uh, now I said it. And the other thing being, of course, that, that we have to take into, to, uh, into consideration is that we have a huge gap between member states and, and, and the, the quality of, of the, the implementation. And I know this is taboo, but I just have to say it anyway, because we're dealing with that also in our house. Uh, I mean, take GDPR as an example. I mean, you go to certain member states, then they don't even know what GDPR is. Uh, at least that's what they are supposing. But, but, they, but, but at, at the, uh, the other thing, at coming in my home country, for instance, we are we are so, you know, obsessed with the idea of implementing things and put 10% on the top just to be sure. So we, ha we, we create a gap, a competition gap between, between industries and companies in Europe. And I think that is by far the most uh, critical issue to discuss. When dealing with cybersecurity, which we all know is important and we do, know, we, we do want to have it and so on and so forth. Very good. Hold that thought because I'm going to, given what you said, I'm going to ask you the question that we asked our audience about sandboxing. Could that be one way to tackle the complexity of doing this in, mm. in the real world? But Yuan, you also had a reaction? Sorry. Yeah, it's one thing that when I listen to the panel is like, I think we all agree that uh, it is a necessary step. The question is about the pace and the, and the ambition there. But what I would like to urge everybody to think that the current system works very well for the perpetrators, for the attackers, for the ones who maliciously use our cyberspace. Yeah. How much time do we give them to continue what they are doing? And how quickly we need to act in order to actually help the defenders? Because now, the more time we take on implementing these things, the more narrower we scope these things, the more we give to the malicious guys. Yeah. That's yeah. a point. Yeah. Okay. Um, so before I ask you about sandboxing, there's a question, um, a very nice question for I think for both Christiana and, and Johan. So clearly, uh, there's we are, we're expected to do more. Anissa is expected to do more. Have you guys already been discussing an update of the ANISA mandate and more resources for ANISA to do that? 
How's that sound? You I guys want to answer? Problem. I understand. It wasn't problem. me. <laughs> <laughs> sandboxing? You want to talk about sandboxing instead? <laughs> Well, uh, you, no, I'll take I mean, no uh, comment. For, if you, if for you sure. Mind. I mean, uh, if, if you look at the plethora of tasks that the Nissan Institute undertake, of course we need more resources. Then the question comes, you know, you can also prioritize and say, okay, you do this first, you do this second. So, I mean, there is a balance there between these things. Uh, but I do believe that if Europe is serious about cybersecurity, we do also need to invest into this and we need to put the resources and capabilities there. If you ask me whether we have the current level, whether it's optimal, I will not say yes, it is. Uh, I don't think it is. But you need skilled people. I mean, we were visiting you in essence, and uh, one of the, the, the key issues there were to get skilled people. Yes. Uh, right. Skills is always the question. Huh? But yeah. I, mean, I mean, like every organization, the organization internally needs to become a talent factory as well. I don't think that we can go to the market and just, uh, you know, mm. grab what we have there. Um, so, but that's a different story. I think. What is important in this particular context that we are discussing is that we also ha understand what are the capabilities and capacities of the community. So it's not only us, no. it's also you, <laughs> it's the member states. And we need to look these capabilities in, in, it, in their entirety and then we can see. I mean, I always say it's, you know, you can put 1,200 people in Inisa, that doesn't make the member states more secure. So I think there is a balance there where we need to look. Very good. Christiana, I don't know if you want to comment. Otherwise, I have another question for you. You mentioned already that it's, Europe is not the only place where there is a drive to do more on products, organizations, entities, etc. Um, and there's a lot going on. Uh, the Commission recently revived with the External Action Service and MISA the uh, Cyber Dialogue with the US. Uh, that's obviously uh, something very important, we would argue, uh, particularly as we, we look at the current geopolitical context. How do you see this discussion developing in the context of the many things that, that you'll have to do with European legislation? I think, actually, <clears throat> I mean, for us, uh, the revival of the EU-US cyber dialogue and the real strengthening we've seen of it uh, when we had it in December is absolutely crucial for us for the implementation of the CRA, for the, actually for these two, for every aspect of what we do, because it is very clear that we have to work with those that are the closest to us, with our trusted partners and allies, and the US is obviously totally key in this respect. What we saw in the U.S. cyber dialogue as well, and we see it now with the new American strategy on cyber, is that we're coming closer and closer. We have always been sharing the objectives on cybersecurity, but I think now we also incre increasingly start to share the approaches. So we see the U.S. is interested in uh, protecting critical infrastructure, in incident reporting, uh, we're working on working arrangements between their agencies and ENISA. But also for the CRA, it's extremely important because the businesses are operating on both markets. So whenever the US, now they're looking at standards, um, there's a chapter in on product liability and how you can have safe harbor and new standards for it. I saw NIST wants to review their standards framework for cybersecurity. So of course, it makes a lot of sense for us to talk very much together and to align as much as possible. Because, I mean, the worst case scenario would of course be that a product would have to follow almost the same standards, but not quite in, in one uh, economic market and almost the same, but not quite in another. This would be, uh, you know, detrimental, uh, I think, and would not serve us at all. So this is really an area that we're very, very keen um, to push ahead on, is this conversation with the Americans on what are the standards you're using, what are you going to use to seek uh, well, they don't use it for compliance as we do, but they still use it. Uh, and I think, and it's coming back also to the capacity to be ready, actually, I think working closely with the US will make us ready faster. Uh, in addition to the fact that, of course, we already have uh, the Red Delegated Act cybersecurity standards, which will give us a really good basis for having standards in place in time for proper implementation. Let's see. Okay, very good. So, 
Uh, Morton, I promised you a question about sandboxing briefly, if you yeah. can. But uh, can this be, you mentioned all the regulation that's coming in mm -hmm. place virtually at the same time. Can we find a way to test this and maybe learn? Because we'll have to revise the rules at some point. So maybe some practical mm -hmm. knowledge of, of how this is done could be useful. Uh, well, it's, it's a common, it's a common, uh, common task. I, I'm a very f uh, big fan of, of sandboxing myself. Uh, I think that uh, most of my colleagues in the European Parliament uh, are, are too. So, so I think this is uh, this is a, a good way forward to actually to deal with these kind of issues. I can't promise you that we will, you know, align all these these uh, these legislative initiatives uh, in one or two weeks. I mean, this is going to be. I mean, we are driving along the way, we're still laying the tracks. So it's it's, it's really timing is a big issue, uh, and speed is a big issue, as Johan also mentioned. So, so I guess we. Cooperation, that should be my, my, my last uh, note on this. Cooperation is key. I mean, and, and the good, and a, on a positive note, I would say that, that looking into this piece of legislation, it seems to be that we now uh, have reached a level of cooperation which actually uh, make good promises for the future because cooperation will be key to, to, to the whole thing in order to, to align all these, these pieces of legislation. Thank you, and thank you all. You mentioned time and speed, and we only have 45 minutes, and uh, that's it for us. Uh, I hope it was a very interesting discussion for you all. I hand it back to, uh, to Meta. Thank you all very much. Thank you.